Greg Minar is undoubtedly the best mountain biker South Africa has ever produced. There are a number of highly talented and determined riders who have made an impact on the international downhill scene. Two of them are 34-year-old Andrew Nietling and his 32-year-old brother John T. Both regulars on the World Cup circuit for many years, they grew up with mountain biking in their blood. Their father Arno was a rider and latterly one of the few UCI-graded mountain bike commissaires until his untimely death early last year. Now retired from racing, John T and Andrew are the joint owners with Jan van Skalfeek of the Hangar Bike Co, a small bike shop on the R44 just outside their hometown of Somerset West. Yeah, so I retired from racing, this is the second year, and um, I went into an ambassador role for Scott Bicycles. So um, I'm lucky to go on trips and we go kind of find new destinations to ride, uh, make content. So I'm doing a lot of filming and video projects, which is great. And then I joined the Crankworks series, which I used to compete as as well. So I'm actually uh, commentating and I'm really, really enjoying that avenue and hopefully providing some sort of value to the sport, learning a lot. And then in my free time, which I've got a little bit more now, um, yeah, stupidly uh, opened up a bike shop to uh, try give back. To be fair, Andrew and I always said we'd never do a bike shop. And then we grew up, we grew up in Somerset West, we were riding on the Helderberg, and this used to be our old Greek restaurant, and we said, well, if that ever opens up, like, that's the perfect spot. It's at the bottom of the trails. We ride past it all the time. It was kind of felt like home anyway and we heard the lease was up and we, we jumped at it. And I joke stupidly, I, I'm really excited that we did it, but the bike shop comes from just years of, of racing and having a knowledge for bicycles. And then after I stopped, my brother, um, he raced competitively as well, and then he helped wrench on my bike, and I just know what a great skill set he has in that. So it kind of just a lot of things came together with um, this location <clears throat> at the bottom of the trails. Um, we saw a gap there, and we just try and want to create a hangout and recreate what I had when I was a youngster, and that's going, hanging out the bike shop, creating a community around bicycles, and honestly hoping that more people will get into riding and get something out of it like we did as brothers. So um, yeah, maybe financially it is a tough industry. We knew that getting in, but we're hoping to just provide a great service, and make it fun again, and get more people out there. I think I spent a lot of time in the, in the garage working on the bikes with my dad. I was. I was the one who stayed up late at night. I know how horrible it is to, to be working on bikes by yourself and no one around, so I kept, I kept him company and kind of got into it from then. And then I, um, I was a privateer with racing overseas, so I had to work on my own bikes. and I learned everything I know from doing it myself. Yeah, the Hangar Bike Co. So um, I've got to give credit to my brother. It was a name that he came up with and it just stuck. Um, but there's, uh, there's a lot of sentiment in there. Uh, my late father was basically, did everything for us in, in our cycling careers. He took us overseas. I don't even want to know what financial pressure he put himself in to get us over there. Um, and he had a love for flying. So he had a private pilot's license. So that's where the hangar came from. The derailleur hangar is an integral part of a bike. So we just couldn't really get away from the name. And the building kind of looks like a hangar and then the hangout. So um, yeah, it's, it's sentimental as well as functional. It's hard work. It's hard work. It's, it's not just a bike shop. You've got to look at all the other things as well as running a business. So uh, the fun part is working on the bikes and then you've got to go home and do emails and do the books and that kind of thing. We, we're fortunate enough to have a good crew here um, that kind of take all that off us. So I can, I can focus on running the store and, and working on the bikes. That, that's literally the role of the shop, is my brother. Without him, the shop wouldn't be, it wouldn't still be standing. You know, I'm still traveling a lot. Um, we've got Stefan, that's his colleague in here. I think he's a huge part to our shop and we're trying to have people in here that have the same sort of mindset as us. And that's hang out, go riding afterwards. Um, we've got Calvin in the back and Smiley. You know, we're trying to maybe develop from the bottom up and John T is really showing his skill and, and developing talent here. We hope that will then be in the workshop and move to the front of the shop. So um, as far as the shop goes, the role is John T is the manager, co-founder, co co-owner, and uh, without him, we wouldn't have a shop. I just kind of get in the way. Back in the day, there was a discipline called dual slalom or dual, and it was a head-to-head -head race. So we'd often end up together racing against each other, where Donald is a timed event, you're not on a track with each other. The duel was a head-to-head -head thing and we'd battle each other, it was cool. 
towards the end of my racing career. I had a couple injuries. Um, but you got to, kind of got to look back and, and take it as it comes and take it on the chin with these injuries. You know it's, it's a sport where you will get injured. Um, it's tricky to come back from injury. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to come back and do one or two more years and then decide that I'd go into the mechanical side and started working for Andrew on his bikes. Well, Andrew was ending his, uh, his, his contract with Giant and um, his new deal had uh, the option of bringing on his own mechanic. I'd been working on his bikes in the off season anyway and we seemed like it was a, a perfect fit. And life and racing can be gone in a flash. So I've definitely learned that with um, my, the passing of my dad and him being such a fanatical support of my racing. And I learned a lot from him. Um, his attitude to life, how hard working he was. And, and I look back with fondness. Like, I, I wish during some of the hard times doing racing, I'd, I'd really force myself to enjoy more because it, it's a lot of pressure. Um, you know, you're only as good as your last race. And when you have a bad one, all the blame is on you and you internalize it. But um, I'm just super grateful that I got that opportunity to race and to fulfill goals and get results that I didn't even think I could achieve. When I was dreaming, I never dreamed of being on a podium or winning races or being in a career and making money for 14 years. That was, I was just racing bikes as a youngster. So um, I look back fondly, but also like, man, it, it went by very quickly. But I think at 32 when I retired, I had a good old go, you know, 14 years. Um, I was not quite getting on with the, the team I was on and I was actually coming back from injury and I think it took me a little bit longer than I expected. Um, you know, you just have that feeling, you know, that in your gut, and I think you have to really, really listen to that. Uh, I wasn't enjoying being away from home for as long, and the results were not quite there. So as well as not finding the team that I felt I could perform on, um, I definitely wanted to go racing if I found the correct team, correct bike, correct, in, correct environment. But I also knew that it's not gonna last forever. Deep down, I had started doubting wanting to race, and then I had to seriously look at that and just know that when you're in it, you feel like there's nothing else you can do or want to do. And then as soon as you retire, you start slowly realizing there's more to life and there's other things that can really, uh, well, you can enjoy and you can find income from and, and focus on. My first World Cup podium, which probably took me longer than everyone else thought it should, and maybe even myself, because I qualified very well, I'd got six places, and, and that became a goal of mine. Off the top tens, it was to get a podium. And when I finally did that, there was just this just big relief to, to do that. But I mean, to be honest, just the friends and the lessons I learned, I think, make it all worthwhile more than any one race, because you will always, be able to not win a race, but I mean, those are just memories, but I've got lifelong memories and friendships that I've gained from being overseas racing. I think I was lucky at that stage. The racing in the States was almost second tier to the World Cup, so you could make a name for yourself in the industry, uh, get sponsors, get support, and then uh, make your way to the World Cup. I think the Enduro has some of the most gifted athletes in the world. Um, a lot of people say it's for washed up downhillers or it's, it's for guys that can't make it in downhill. I think now the new crop in Enduro, you're seeing that they choose to race Enduro. It's not because they can't race World Cup downhill, they're not fast enough. Maybe back in the day it was, was like that. So it's a discipline that takes extreme skill set plus fitness. Um, I'm still a purist downhill at heart. Um, I don't think you're gonna see that every day. I think you need to focus on one or the other, and I think he's just a rider that's young and impressively skillful on any bike he touches. Yeah. Well, exactly that. I think in down all these days, there's just such a wealth of talent. It's so diverse. You've got different winners. You've got someone like Amir Perron, which we all knew had speed, and now on the right team, the right bike, and you know he ticks off one result and the confidence is there, now he has self-belief, he goes on to pretty much dominate the season. So I think you can't just pick, but I love the new crop of riders, like Amri Perron, Loris Vergier, Brooke McDonald back on form. I, I like guys that are, are working hard but having fun out there. They're making the sport great. I'm like so proud of this new crop, keeping it fun, you know, because the, everyone's very professional. Behind closed doors, behind the jokes, they're in the gym, um, especially even at the later end of my career. I mean, we were training so hard and almost took the fun out of it. And I like that this new crop of riders is bringing the fun back.
we have some extremely talented guys, but I think as a youngster is, is race as much as you can. And, and that's where we have a little bit of a problem in this country and that starts at the top coming down in our race series. So I think get out there, race as much as you can, try emulate your stars and um, get as much experience as you can. And if you can afford to go overseas, you need to go overseas as quickly and as soon as possible. It is expensive, but that's the only way. Yeah, I mean, this country especially, they're 29er fanatics, where I still think 27.5 um, works just as well or better in certain uh, applications. So, um, yeah, I think we've got to the point that uh, 27 and 29 are here to stay, depending on what you do. Um, and that's the same thing that you asked, is what type of riding are you doing? Are you doing a marathon epic, or are you going out with your buddies trail riding? And then there, there's two different wheel sizes that can work, yeah. Downhill bikes are really expensive and they're not accessible. You can't just go out and ride your downhill bike. You need a lift to the top. Not everyone can get that. Not everyone can get on a bike or no one wants to push up. So Enduro, with the bikes of today, you can ride the downhills that, that are out there. I hate to say it, but whatever's gonna get me down the hill faster. And uh, I think for racing applications, if you get the right bike on a 29er and the, and the rider, and I'm a tall stature, it probably will be faster if I get used to it. But I think people mustn't be so quick to just grab what the racer is doing at a World Cup because depending on your style, um, 27 can still work. We've seen people still win races on a 27. Would Yeah, it'd be a trail bike, 150 mil trail bike that you can slowly pedal to the top and, and bomb it downhill. So I think anyone that's not doing like the Cape Epic, I think um, should at least be on a 120 mil bike and more. I think they're light enough, the dropper seat posts are safer for riders to go downhill and uh, that's what we're trying to do here as well, is maybe educate a rider on a bike he could ride that he still gets uh, enjoyment, he still gets fitness, but it's safer and just greater downhill. Yeah. From being a rider that started with V-brakes onto disc to suspension, I think dropper post is actually one of the most important things that have come out of the bicycle industry. Definitely, obviously, disc brake suspension. Um, I think we're just at a point where we're fine tuning things. I think e-bikes is the next evolution. I think the lighter an e-bike gets is just going to blow the doors wide open. And I think what's great is that's getting more people into riding that would never have ridden and are going to keep people riding for longer at older ages. So I think the e-bike is the evolution. And to be honest, I ride that quite a lot as well. <laughs> almost as much as my other bikes. I definitely started for fun and I hope most people did. To get on a bicycle when you take your first pedal strokes without training wheels, I mean that is just an amazing, amazing experience and I think, yes, getting into racing as me, I, through parts of my career, definitely lost some of the passion. Um, so I hope everyone out there like realizes that racing is great and if that's what drives you, but there's so much more to mountain biking. And then and, and we're seeing it with these trail centers. We're seeing people here at the bike shop on a Saturday um, and they're, they're going out for a ride in a group, having a coffee afterwards and then sharing stories. And I think that what the other side of the world has, bike parks and that camaraderie of riding together and just doing laps, you know, taking the shuttle or the, the ski lift up and riding down, I think, um, this country can really benefit from it, but we are. Um, I see trail builders making a living from building trails, building the community, and that's, that's what I think the future is. Yeah, like I said, I'm lucky to still be in the industry doing what I do going overseas, but I think what impresses me the most is how popular the sport is. You know, when I was a youngster at school, I was that odd kid on a BMX bike, they called it, because no one really knew what mountain biking was. But now it's gone pretty much mainstream, even too mainstream for me to even relate to, you know, so I think the enduro and downhill scene is always going to be a bit behind overseas, but what's great is people are learning it and what's amazing is obviously what Cape Epic has done. Um, it's a double-edged sword. It got more people into biking, but I feel they're missing out. I feel like the trail and enduro, maybe not the downhill is a pretty specialized sport, but the fun factor of riding and riding these bikes that are so capable, um, I think it's just uh, amazing to see. Everything was strict and it was to a program when I was training. And don't get me wrong, I'm not downplaying it. I had a great time racing. But now I get to ride, you know, when the shop closes and I go with my brother and we just go for an hour at the most. Or I go for two hours, I just ride for pure, pure enjoyment. 
And then I'm obviously doing a lot of photo shoots and things like that. So I'm getting to see places that when I was racing, I didn't have the time and I couldn't go away and go for a ride, have a beer afterwards and things like that. So I'm doing a lot of riding just for myself, for enjoyment. I try to get out two, three times a week. Uh, winter's a bit tough, but in summer we, could, we ride from the shop. Close the shop up at five and go for a two, three hour ride. When you're racing professionally, it's very single-minded focus and you actually have to be selfish to a certain extent, um, which is just the way it is if you want to get to the top. Um, but now I'm, I'm really seeing life from a, a wider perspective and yeah, I'm, I'm probably more nervous than he is. He seems to be handling it very well, but yeah, I'm looking forward to these other things and I'll have more time to, to spend with my brother, the shop, and yeah, he'll be a father soon. That's all from this week's edition of Toyota Cadence.